An intervertebral disc is interposed between vertebrae from the cervical axis to the sacrum. This results in intervertebral discs losing their elasticity, flexibility, and shock absorbing capabilities. Thinning of discs occurs as a nucleus propulsus, which is a gelatinous center of the disc, starts to dry out and shrink. It's common in people over age 60. Compression of the nerve roots and the cord may occur, and damage to the spine by degenerative disc disease contributes to osteoarthritis of the spine by formation of osteophytes, which are the bone spurs. Acute herniated intervertebral disc is a slip disc and can be a result of natural degeneration with age, repeated stress or trauma to the spine, and the nucleus propulsus may first bulge and then herniate, which places pressure on the nerves. The most common ruptures are at the lumbosacral disc most common feature of a lumbar disc damage is low back pain. The indications of a disc herniation is radicular pain that radiates down the buttocks and below the knee and is along the distribution of the sciatic nerve. A straight leg raising test may be positive. Multiple nerve root compression may be manifested as bowel and bladder incontinence or impotence. X-rays are done to note structural damage. Myelogram, MRI, or CT scan look at localized damage sites. Epidural venogram or discogram may be necessary and an EMG of extremities determines the severity of nerve irritation. Collaborative care. Manage first with at least four weeks of conservative therapy. There's limitations of extremes of the spinal movement, so the patient would need to use a brace, corset, or belt. Conservative treatment can result in a healing over damaged area if not due to degenerative disc disease. Once symptoms subside, Back straining exercises begin twice a day and encourage for a lifetime. Patients should be taught principles of good body mechanics. Extremes of flexion and torsion are strongly discouraged. Most patients initially recover with a conservative treatment plan, and if unsuccessful, radiculopathy becomes progressively worse. Part of this conservative therapy is traction, a TENS unit, drug therapy, nonsteroidals first before short-term opioids and muscle relaxants, and lastly, epidural corticosteroid injections. Intradiscal electrothermoplasty. This is a minimally invasive outpatient procedure and may help in treating back and sciatica pain. Involves insertion of a needle into the affected disc with guidance of an x-ray. The wire is then threaded down through the needle and into the disc. The wire is heated, which denervates small nerve fibers that have grown into cracks and invaded degenerating disc. Heat also partially melts the annulus, triggering the body to generate new reinforcing proteins in fibers. It's indicated when diagnostic tests indicate the problem is not responding to conservative treatment and the patient is in consistent pain. And some patients, for some unknown reason, do not improve after surgery and symptoms may actually worsen. Radiofrequency discal nucoplasty. This is also known as a cobulation nucoplasty, and the needle is inserted into the disc, which is similar to the interdiscal electrothermoplasty. It's a special radiofrequency probe is used. 20% of the nucleus is removed. It decompresses the disc and decreases pressure on both disc and surrounding nerve roots. Intraspinous process decompression system. It's made of titanium and fits into the mount placed on the vertebra in the lower back indicated when pain is due to spinal stenosis. It pushes open the spinal cord by pressing against parts of either side of the vertebra. Alanaminectomy is a surgical procedure to relieve pressure on the spinal cord due to spinal stenosis. In a laminectomy, a small section of bone covering the back of the spinal cord is removed. As with all major surgical procedures, complications can occur, like problems with anesthesia, thrombophlebitis, infection, and nerve damage. Laminectomy surgery can cause spinal segments to loosen, making it unstable. The facet joints that connect the back of the spine normally give enough stability even when the lamina is taken off. But sometimes these joints may have to be removed if they are enlarged with arthritis. During a total laminectomy, the facet joints are removed. This procedure creates extra space around the nerves but can lead to segmental instability. This is when the patient may end up having a spinal fusion to fix the loose segment. Spinal fusion is a procedure that joins together bones in the back. It is sometimes effective for neck problems and can be combined with a disectomy. A disectomy is a surgical removal of herniated disc material that press on a nerve root or the spinal cord. 
Before the disc material is removed, a small piece of bone, the lamina, from the affected vertebra may be removed. The discs are the pads that separate the vertebra. This procedure is commonly used when a herniated or ruptured disc in the low back is putting pressure on a nerve root. The patient should get out of bed and use medication to control pain. Resume exercise and other activities gradually and sit as long as they are comfortable. Most people avoid sitting for longer than 15 to 20 minutes. After surgery, sitting can be uncomfortable for a while. Use walking as a primary form of exercise for the first several weeks. Getting up frequently to walk around will help decrease the risk that excess scar tissue will form. They could have some of the same complications that we talked about in laminectomy. Problems with anesthesia, thrombophobitis, infection, and nerve damage. Pre-op teaching. Have the patient practice log rolling and explain that it will be done by the nurses for the first day or two and then the patient can do it alone. To ensure healing, the spinal column must remain in alignment when turning and moving. Explain the importance of taking pain medications regularly. Pain is easier to control if medications are taken before the pain is severe. And pain may be the same following surgery for a herniated intervertebral disc because edema due to the surgery irritates and compresses the nerve roots. Let the patient know they may need to use a fractured bedpan. The patient will usually remain flat in bed for a period of time following the surgery and a fractured bedpan is more comfortable for patients who must lie flat. The patient will need to eat while lying flat and this position prevents flexion of the spine. The patient should also demonstrate the incentive barometer and leg exercises and that these are measures to prevent circulatory and respiratory complications. Most patients will require opioids for 24 to 48 hours. The preferred method of continued pain management is patient controlled analgesia. Once fluids are being taken, they can switch to oral drugs and possibly muscle relaxant. They need to have enough staff post-op to help move patients without undue pain or strain on staff and the patient. Repeat assessments every two to four hours during the first 48 hours post-surgery. Paresthesias may not be immediately relieved after surgery, but note any new muscle weakness or paresthesia and report to the surgeon. Extremity circulation should be assessed by temperature, capillary refill, and pulses. Monitor the bowel and bladder. Instruct the patient to avoid sitting for prolonged periods of time and encourage walking and shifting weight from one foot to the other when standing. A paralytic ileus and interference with bowel function may occur for several days. Assess for nausea, abdominal distension, and constipation. Stool softeners may aid in the relief and prevention of constipation. Early ambulation is needed in the postoperative period, and it is the nurse's responsibility to know specific orders related to activity. If the patient is to have a donor site, the most common is the posterior iliac crest. The fibula is also common. Usually, a patient will heal quicker if they use a cadaver bone. You will also need to regularly assess the bone graft and the donor site as these usually cause more pain than a fused area. Twisting of the spine is contraindicated. Thighs and knees should be used to absorb the shock of activity and movement, and a firm mattress or bedboard is essential to protect the spine. A hematoma may form at the surgical site. If untreated, it may cause irreversible neurologic deficits including paraplegia and bowel and bladder dysfunction. If the spinal canal was entered during surgery, there is a potential for cerebral spinal fluid to leak. Severe headaches or leakage of CSF on a dressing should be reported. CSF appears as clear or slightly yellow drainage on a dressing. CSF has high concentrations of glucose and a dipstick test for glucose would be positive. Make sure you document amount, color, and characteristics of the drainage. Nerve root compressions may cause permanent damage resulting in foot drop in a lumbar lamy patient. To check cervical laminectomy, check the patient's grip because nerve root compression may also cause permanent damage resulting in hand weakness. Also, for cervical lamy, check for hoarseness and report hoarseness to the physician and further assess the patient's ability to swallow. Damage to the laryngeal nerve may cause permanent hoarseness. Impaired ability to swallow puts the patient at risk for aspiration. Assess for urinary retention. The patient should void within eight hours after surgery. If the physician allows, let males stand to void and compare the intake and output for each eight hour period. 
all patients who receive general anesthesia are at risk for urinary retention. The patient who has had a lumbar laminectomy may have even more difficulty voiding as a result of stimulation of the sympathetic nerves during surgery. Because of surgery-induced edema, the patient is likely to experience either the same pain or perhaps more severe pain in the period immediately after surgery. This pain usually persists for several weeks after surgery. In addition, many patients who have had a lumbar laminectomy have muscle spasms in the lower back, abdomen, and thigh for the first few days after surgery. Assess for infection by taking and recording the vital signs at least every four hours, report increased body temperature, assess the wound and dressing for signs of infection, increase redness, drainage, pain, and pus. Use sterile technique to change the dressing, and the surgical patient is always at risk for infection.